Welcome back to the episode 15 of Reading Between the Lines with Tandemat. Today I have with me Charmaine Short, all the way from Edinburgh, Scotland. She is the founder of Etevers and Women of Crypto Art. She also has done a lot of work on diversity and inclusion. And we're going to talk a lot about all of that in this interview. It's great to have you with us, Charmaine. Thanks. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Um, so for the people that don't know you, Charmaine, why don't you go ahead and give us a brief introduction about yourself? So I've been working in the IT consultancy industry and financial services for over 20 years in senior management positions, delivering IT programs across government, banks and retail. And I got very frustrated with the bureaucracy and the pace that some Web2 projects go at. So I decided to um, leave and set up my own business. So um, in, in 2019, uh, I first got into cryptocurrency. And at the start of 2020, uh, there was a, a global disease that we all know about. And I had uh, booked a holiday to Florence in Italy because I love art. And I was going to see some of the famous art galleries there. And when everyone got locked down, that was then cancelled. And I had a lot of spare cash in my wallet. And I wanted to know what to do with it. So I started buying NFTs, um, which were you know, one of one artworks. And they were very affordable at that stage. I was buying NFTs for $11 you know, in, in ETH. Ethereum was only worth about $200 back at that time. So very good time to get into it. Uh, that's how my, my passion for the metaverse really started was um, through thinking of ways that people can actually display their NFTs when you're in a lockdown situation and you can't show your art to visitors at your house that's on your wall. You have to show your art digitally. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you this then. What kind of NFTs did you purchase? Was it uh, like Bode Pure Club? What did those NFTs have in utility? What kind of NFTs did you purchase back in 2020? Right. So in 2020, utility wasn't really a thing. <laughs> so it was all about the art. I, I, I have one rule. I must like the art before I buy it. So I I always think if you buy a piece of art, whether it's physical or digital, um, you know, you're maybe buying it as an investment to sell it for more money than you bought it down the line. But even if you don't ever sell it, you still have a piece of cool art that you like. So I started on a website called Super Rare and it was everything is a one of one on there. So you're the only person that owns that piece of art. And um, I got animated art. Um, there's a lot of um, success, you know, artists who went on to become very successful after they launched on Super Rare. And they became so successful that people couldn't get enough of their art. And that's when the additions started to come in. I mean, now you can find some 10,000 PFPs of a board at Yacht Club or whatever. But back in 2020, the majority of NFTs were unique and that's what made them rare and attractive to own. Absolutely. All right, um, Charmaine, let me ask you this question. Since you've lived in, you live in Scotland and you've lived in Germany, um, I presume you have the understanding of both the British culture and well, Scottish culture and the German culture. Um, and you are in that unique position to think of both NFT and Web3 and Metaverse from the angle of a German person as well as a Scottish person. And anyone that comes on this program, I definitely ask them this question because it gives you a unique perspective when you can speak multiple languages or whether you, can, you have lived in different cultures it gives you two different personalities, right? So when you're uh, looking at uh, these two cultures, what similarities or differences do you see in how they're approaching Web3 and Metaverse and NFTs? Right, so 
they're they're not too dissimilar. I think um, one of the main differences between people in Scotland and people in Germany is the sense of humour. You know, so people in the UK generally um, are very into sort of satire and sort of clever um, sort of humour. But in places like Germany, it's more obvious and, um, you know, it's maybe more childish. <laughs> but they, they don't get the subtleties of the Scottish humour. So you have to think that if you're, you're building something that's to be for different nationalities, you know, the first thing is you, it has to be in more than one language. You know, most things are in English because most countries in the world, you know, they, they have to learn English to get by in Web3. But there should be a way that people can communicate and have communities in their native language. Absolutely. Um, do you think Scotland is utilizing the NFT technology quick enough? I'll give you an example. One of the leading industries within Scotland is the alcoholic industry, right? Scotch industry. Do you yeah. think they are utilizing the NFT technology? Because essentially, uh, there is one part of Scotch, which is the consumption side, and then there is the collection side of Scotch, right? A lot of people collect 50-year-old 50 50 year Scotches and stuff. So do you think those breweries are using NFTs to their full potential? Well, yes. Um, maybe not the full potential, but I can think of at least one example. So there's a very popular NFT artist called Trevor Jones. He comes up in the top 10 NFT artists. And he recently did uh, an artwork. It was an oil painting with augmented reality in it. And it was all to do with the Macallan distillery. So Macallan's a very famous brand of malt whiskey in Scotland. And so the, this went to one of the auction houses. So people were bidding on this cask of very rare whiskey, right? And they were going to get the oil painting and the NFT to go with it. So this would prove authenticity and ownership of that cask of whiskey. And I, I don't remember exactly how much it sold for, but it sold for millions of pounds. <laughs> so, so that was a really good example. And I remember the NFT artwork was quite beautiful because it was abstract, but it had things like things to do with the distilling process, you know, the, the bells. And, and there's a thing in whiskey distillery called the Angel's Share, um, which is that if you've got whiskey in a barrel for 12 years, say, then some of it will evaporate. And so you maybe fill the cask originally, but there's less in it. So there's an allowance for tax purposes of the angel's share that you think, well, that whiskey has disappeared. And all these different elements of the whiskey were included in the work of art. It was quite beautiful and, and quite groundbreaking. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. As we're sitting in 2020, um, there's a lot of issues that every society has to deal with, right? Um, UK has had to deal with a few more than others in the recent history, right? We see the cost of living crisis, the trade disruptions due to Brexit, so many things, right? Um, what are some use cases that not only Scotland, but UK could use when it comes to NFT technology, Web3, Metaverse, uh, be it for public policy or private uh, operators in terms of private businesses, um, not only to, to advance um, humanity, but also to advance commerce and, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of things they could do. I mean, there's a lot of poverty, like they call it fuel poverty, because people can't afford to put their heating on. There's a saying, you either heat or you eat with your money because of the price of fuel. So if the government was able to airdrop cryptocurrency or some sort of token that was, you know, fuel credits to give to, to people who are struggling, that, that, that could be a very quick way to distribute funds. Obviously, there would be a lot of education to onboard people because let's face it, it's not got mass adoption yet. 
Web3 blockchain wallets. But yeah, we could we could provide the, the onboarding so that people don't know what's going on in the background. They just know that they've got the funds to, to pay whatever bills they want. So that's one way. And also people suffer a lot with mental health because of the state of the country. And I find that anybody that I speak to that goes in the metaverse, they find they can speak to like-minded people. It's fun, it's relaxing, you can meet people and it really improves your state of mental health if you can go around in a metaverse environment where there's none of the, the bad things that are going on in the real world. You know, you can have parties, you can wander around art galleries, you can have you know, nightclub events, you can have all sorts of fun experiences in the metaverse to escape from the real world. Absolutely. Um, as, as we are aware of the metaverse industry, one of the first use cases was play to earn games, right? Whether it be Axie Infinity, Sandbox, Decentraland, Upland Metaverse or whatever. Um, as you rightly said, a lot of people, not only in UK, but Europe at large right now, are facing this cost of living crisis, right? Where it's eating or eating. Um, so do you think the public at large are utilizing these tools, which is play to earn, where perhaps you play a game and you earn cryptocurrencies? Because yes, the government can definitely do that. But at some point, a little bit of onus is also on us, right? So do you think that the public is also um, working or, or is aware of uh, play to earn games in the first place? Because perhaps they're not even aware of such things, right, in, in UK? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. So people generally in the gaming um, area, so people who love to play games online, they tend to be, and I don't mean everyone, but they tend to be anti-play to earn. <laughs> they, they, they look at it like, I play games for fun. Why would I be playing games to make money? That turns it into like a job or work, which obviously is less attractive. We play games to escape and enjoy ourselves. So there's a bit of education there to say, well, yeah, but when you're playing your game, like Fortnite or whatever, then you're earning tokens, in-game tokens that you can exchange for skins or whatever other in-game assets. Why wouldn't you want to have ownership of that asset, take it with you to another game on another platform, sell it, get the money for it? So I don't understand why the gaming community is so against play to earn. I think it would help them, but it's just a case of maybe rebranding it. If they call it, you know, play to have fun and, and build your wardrobe or something like that, maybe that would help, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if I was to ask you to put a put a figure on how many people are even aware of NFT Web3 or Metaverse within the UK or Europe at large as well, um, what would be your answer? How many people even know that there is something such as this that exists? Oh, I'd say it'd be under 10%. I mean, I think when, when you say metaverse, most people think Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook that changed its name to Meta. And as I'm sure you know, that is not the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so moving on, let me uh, move on to the next section. And you have been a founding member of a project called Women of Crypto Art, which is a DAO. What is it? What are you trying to achieve? Right. So Women of Crypto Art, uh, we're called Hello Woke Up on Twitter. It's a collection of over 1,300 women artists. Uh, and it's not just women who can join. Men are welcome to join. Non-binary people are welcome to join the organisation. But we want to promote and support women artists in the NFT industry, women creators. So it could be digital fashion, it could be um, 3D art, it could be anything. And what we do is we put on 
collaborative exhibitions in various metaverses like crypto voxels, Decentraland, Sandbox, anywhere really. And we, we had a massive exhibition earlier this year called the Graffiti Queens. So there were over 200 women artists um, displaying about 400 works of digital art in various metaverse locations. It was like a little mini festival. And it just helps make people aware that there are thousands of women in crypto and in NFTs and in the metaverse. Because one of the things that sort of resonated with some of the women that I know is that when you go on Twitter, it's all very crypto bro. It's like, hey, bro, GM. It's like, well, we're not all your bro. <laughs> Many of us are women. Um, and it just tries to raise the awareness that there are thousands of women there. <laughs> Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Um, do you think the representation of women within not only crypto, but even metaverse, NFT and Web3 as we speak, is to a level that you find and generally women find satisfactory? No. Well, I actually had to write a white paper on the subject because I felt quite strongly about it. I wrote a white paper called Inclusion, Diversity and Accessibility in the Metaverse. And this was because in the early days, I was invited to a round table in a Metaverse, which I will not name. And the, the discussion was to be, how can we get more women to use our Metaverse? So I turned up for this you know, web, webinar thing in the metaverse, choosing my avatar, the only avatar available was a white male. Uh, and I, I sort of messaged the, the coordinator and I said, well, how do I choose a female avatar? And he said, oh, there isn't one. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, you want a whole bunch of women to stand around this table in the metaverse talking about getting women into your metaverse. You're really not meeting our needs. And he said, well, yeah, it, it is a use case on the backlog, but we didn't see it as a priority. What? So I, I didn't attend that round table because I thought, well, no, I'm going to boycott your metaverse. You're not meeting my needs. You failed at the first hurdle. Shortly after that, they did realise their mistake. and There was then a female avatar available. The, the other thing that bothers me with some of the games is most of the female avatars, they look like Lara Croft, you know, the massive boobs, unrealistic figure, wearing a bikini. I don't want to wonder about the metaverse looking like that. I want to be a real woman, a normal woman. Um, and I think it's quite dangerous for, for sort of younger females to think that that's the ideal and that they have to look like that in order to be popular. So yeah, we, we need a lot more metaverses. It is getting better, but we need metaverses where we can look like however we want to look. I could look like a dinosaur, I could look like a chicken, I could look like you know a 10 foot tall person, whatever. Just have to get away from the stereotype, Lara Croft type female avatar. <laughs> is it, isn't the solution the fact that women should be on the executive committees of these uh, metaverses and ideally start metaverses themselves and be founders? Absolutely, yes. So we want more diversity in the people who are building the metaverse platforms. We want women, non-binary people, people of colour, people of different religions. We want people with disabilities. We want people who speak different languages different religions we want everyone to have a say uh, i mean i've heard um, stories about um some black ladies that i know very nice and uh, but they have they have big hairstyles right and when they were wearing like the oculus quest vr headset the the strap was snapping because you know it wasn't good enough for their hairstyle 
So, and you know, who tested the Oculus Quest? Oh, white men. Mm, that explains it. So there's all these types of things. You need to get the diversity of people designing the products to make sure that they're suitable for everyone. Absolutely. Um, moving on, let's talk about Etaverse. Etaverse is your startup, right? What yes. is Etaverse and what are you trying to do with Etaverse? Right. So I, I love Web3 blockchain, metaverse, NFTs. And I've spent a lot of time trying to get the message out to other people. And I thought the best way to do it is to start my own consultancy business. So I can onboard Web2 brands or individual creators, just teach them, you know, how do you get a wallet? What are the platforms where you can sell your work? What is the market? What do the collectors look for? And it just, we provide marketing services and strategies, coaching, and just general education. Um, and we're also members of the Metaverse Standards Forum, which is trying to build some sort of standards. I mean, it's like the Wild West right now. There's no regulations and standards. I mean, nobody ever managed to standardize Web2. So it's, it's a massive task. But we're hoping that if like-minded people come together in working groups and decide, you know, what is the best way forward for, say, digital fashion standards or any other area of the metaverse and just make some agreements. And these will be voluntary things. We don't want to go down the regulation route where we're saying you must do this or you will be punished. We want people to step up with their ideas and just decide collectively on this is the best way. Because what we're building now at the start of Web3, where we're so early, but we can shape this thing with learning from the lessons in Web2 that wasn't very <laughs> inclusive. Absolutely. Um, so as, as you gave me a brief introduction of what Etaverse is, Etaverse is a consultancy and marketing agency, right? Yes. Um, and you, you've extensively worked and talked, even in this interview, about getting more women in, in uh, the Metaverse in Web3 and working on that diversity and inclusion, right? So if someone's listening to this uh, interview and perhaps a woman or person of color or member of LGBTQ plus community um, and they're listening to you as a consultant what's your advice to them on how they can perhaps start their own metaverse or work um, at an executive level um, within a metaverse so it looks representative of them as well and not just the the people that are building that metaverse yeah, so Web3 is all about community. And I think it gives equal opportunities for everyone to get involved. So if anyone is interested, look for these groups on Twitter or Discord. Join, you know, they usually have a Discord group. Get involved there to say, hey, I'd like to help. How can I help you? Because a lot of people, when they come into Web3, they think what's in it for them. But it's not what Web3 can do for you. It's what you can do to help the communities in Web3. And if you're willing to start by volunteering your time and say, well, I've got a few hours a week. If you've got some ideas or you're having a workshop, I'll join in. Just get involved. And you'll find that everyone is really welcoming and really friendly. And they, they love the ideas coming in. So that's, that's the way to, to get in there. Most of the projects I've got involved in, in the, the metaverse, have been by accident. I've fallen into it. I've been in the right place at the right time. Someone was having a conversation and I just got involved. And, and nobody tells you, no, you, we don't want your opinion. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a lot of the aspect of Web3 and metaverse um, as you say, 
that people should sort of try to get involved, right? A lot of that depends on your skills and capability to do work with 3D items or designing 3D items. Mm -hmm. Do you see the skill shortage in sort of working with these softwares, whether it's AutoCAD or PSD or Unreal Engines or, or any of these other um, softwares, right? Do you think that that uh, skills gap is one of the biggest issues and if it is do you think the government has a, 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 a role to play in at least um, trying to work with this because we all know that UK government had a very successful apprenticeship program right um, where they helped young uh, people upskill themselves by getting apprenticeships do you think that they should be working on something similar for Web3? Absolutely, yes. There is a skill shortage. So I am involved right now. Um, I'm doing the marketing for a project called Lost Paradigms. It's a, an NFT Twitter banner style project, which is very popular. We have a very talented dev team. We've got four devs creating the smart contracts, building the, the website with all the allow list rules. It's very complicated. And these guys are very much in demand. Anybody who has any sort of solidity skills or you know, any other sort of blockchain development skills, highly in demand. And, and I know what you're talking about with the apprenticeship program. I took on apprentices years ago and you know, these are people who left school, didn't go to college, didn't go to university. They are now, you know, got very high flying jobs in the IT industry because I took them on as a, a testing apprentice. So it's a very good way to get your leg into the, the career ladder. What I find with certainly schools, that they're teaching really, you know, the, te the IT teachers in schools, this may be an unpopular opinion, but they are not talented to be shaping the young minds in what are the right computer programming skills. I think there needs to be an overhaul of the curriculum at school um, for anybody who's interested in coding because for the generation coming up now, coding is going to be an essential thing. You know, if you want to be a, a fashion designer, you're not going to be you know, having a big piece of fabric in front of you you're going to be doing it on a computer screen in 3D. So these skills are so important and the government should be focusing on getting the modern languages taught. Absolutely. Uh, that is a very interesting take on it. And let me, let me sort of push back and get your perspective. Do you think coding is more important or do you think designing is more important? Because we all know that designing is also something that is going to be used, right? Designing is more, a little bit more visual, less writing code, but it's equally useful yes. for the web three. So, absolutely. So not everybody is maths orientated. <laughs> not everybody's cut out to be a developer. So the design is important, and I, and I think we're heading into a world where we have AI. So all the mundane routine jobs are going to be programmed by a computer to do for us. Like if you go to the supermarket now, you don't speak to someone who's like putting your messages through. You go to a, a terminal and, and it messages, you know, it brings up your shopping for you. So jobs for people um, that are mundane, they, are, they will disappear. But you're always going to need creative people. So... The AI would have to get pretty sophisticated to design beautiful functional things. So that is a good route for people um, if they're thinking about their career, is either go into the programming side or go into the creative design side. Absolutely. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. One of the biggest issues that a lot of um, countries that have a lot of uh, immigration and a lot of opponents of uh, immigration, the biggest reason that they cite is lack of integration.
that new immigrants don't integrate into the culture, right? They bring their culture, which is fine, but they don't integrate and uh, assimilate within our culture. And that is one of the biggest reasons that the people against um, immigration say. Do you think Web3 and Metaverse can address that by helping new immigrants or potential immigrants that do want to come to uh, to Europe or UK or Scotland or England um, with local people who can teach them etiquettes, what to do, how to do, um, how to behave when you come to the UK society and sort of add that to the points-based system that UK already has. Uh, maybe add that as part of the asylum process for refugees that are coming to uh, Europe and help integrate them into the European society. I think that's a great idea. One of the powers of the metaverse is that your avatar can look like anything you want. Um, I know a lady who's creating digital fashion, it's modest digital fashion, so it's like the hijab for people of that religion, and that's fine. Um, so in real life, they wear the hijab, and in the metaverse, they want to wear it as well. And that's, we have to have a, a respectful culture. We have to respect other people's religions and beliefs and live in harmony. And I think the metaverse is very good for that because you can project the image that you want to be seen by the world. And I know that, I don't know if this is still the case, but you people used to have to know about British culture, like the programme EastEnders, things like that. Maybe that's a bit outdated now, and maybe there's new role models and popular things that immigrants need to learn about. But you know, the metaverse, if, if people in the UK like being in the metaverse, then yeah, let all the immigrants learn about the metaverse. We're all starting our metaverse journey from the same point. So it's more of a level playing field. And I think if you can be welcoming to people in the metaverse and just answer any questions that they have, then that's a really good thing. There's also, I mean, I know there's a lot of racism and bullying, and you know, there, there's some bad things going on in the world, but in the metaverse, you can protect against that. There's lots of protections already in gaming for children, so they can't be groomed by catfishes and all these horrible things but what about adults in the metaverse you know we can make our settings so that no other avatar can come within our boundary you know um, or we can not receive messages that have swear words in them there's all these settings that we can protect ourselves and I think that's important to make someone feel welcome in your world your metaverse world is allow them to just see the positive things about your community absolutely um within the european union there's a debate on who should pay for the internet bandwidth should it be big tech or should it be the telecom companies as we move forward the internet bandwidth is just going to get slower and slower when it comes to rendering Web3 or Metaverse or, or the future, right? Uh, because as we build out these heavy three-dimensional uh, platforms, it's going to require that much more bandwidth. What's your opinion on, on, on this proposal by our European Union? Yeah, so you're going to need massive GPU servers and, you know, 5G, 6G, so much processing power. Um, I think probably whoever's making the most money out of it should be paying for it. So whether that's the a combination of the big telecom companies and the big tech companies, um, because if, if it grinds to a halt or is unreliable, unstable, people are just not going to use it. Absolutely. Don't you think that they would pass that cost on to customers then? If that additional cost <laughs> They'll is find a way to do that, yeah. <laughs> the customer always ends up paying, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, right now, we, we see something which we hope that none of us have to ever 
witness in our lifetime again in Europe with the whole uh, situation going on in Ukraine, right? Um, and and with the entire energy crisis that's going on, do you fear Europe may be left behind in the Web3 race because Europe is right now dealing with um, the energy crisis and especially in Germany where it's really badly affected, uh, where all the resources are being diverted to uh, essential services such as hospitals or fire departments or, or essential services like that, right? So do you see that having an impact for the next two to three years, which are crucial for um, playing catch up for Web3? Yeah, it, in a way, it's a bit like the, the race to be first on the moon, isn't it? <laughs> so every country wants to you know, plant their flag in Web3. I know in Dubai and the United Arab Emirates, there's a lot of money there and a lot of effort going into building out Web3. So I think they are ones to watch for being leaders in that area. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough it's what they call like a, a horrible problem, isn't it? You know, do do you have your hospitals running or are you building the future? And, and in, in a way, you, you have to be very clever with your finances and find a way to do both. Absolutely. It's, it's uh, great that you mention United Arab Emirates because UAE not only is building 40,000 metaverse jobs, they have a metaverse ministry and a metaverse minister. The job of that metaverse minister is not only to work on the metaverse, they are going to operate within the metaverse. Wow. Do you think European countries are behind the curve and do you think they should catch up? Absolutely. I mean, I think when last year, or maybe it wasn't last year, the COP26 um conference right so this was all about global change the ozone layer all that and there was leaders from every country around the world all came to scotland for cop 26 i mean for, apart from the money um, that that cost wasting government funds of every country and spreading germs whatever um, all that could have been done in the metaverse people could have done it from their own country and just met in the metaverse. And I think they really missed the trick. So, you know, flying people all over the world to talk about how do we save the planet was just completely crazy. <laughs> do you see parliaments and United Nations ever uh, operating from the metaverse? Definitely, yeah. I don't know how long it will be until it happens, but they will have to. This is a global arena. We'll, we have global issues, you know, the energy crisis, the ozone layer. These are things that affect all countries. And it's really unrealistic to expect leaders or representatives from every country to meet in a real life location. Absolutely. Do you, do you see all the technology development that is sort of blurring the lines of national borders and national agencies? Do you see that pushing all of us to a global one world, one village, one government sort of situation? Well, I think there's so many egos involved with countries and governments. I don't think we'll, they'll ever allow it, really. <laughs> they'll still want their own little empire. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very nice idea. Absolutely. Um, with that, let's move on to the final section of our interview, which is rapid fire questions. Um, this is my favorite uh, section because I get to understand people's thought patterns, how they think and what do they think and, and, and so on. So let me, let me get right into it. Um, the future of metaverse, does it belong to big tech? Or does it belong to companies like Upland, Sandbox, Decentraland, and why? Right, I think the companies that started it, like Sandbox and Decentraland, um, they were the trailblazers. But I think big tech will come and buy those companies and buy all their expertise. So it will end up in the hands of big tech. 
Do you think regulators would allow that with the situation that's going on with big tech all around the world? Yeah, I, I think there's probably, there's ways around it that the big tech, they'll set up smaller companies, but they will be the, the overall owner. I think they'll find a way around it to uh, work within the regulations because there's no regulations right now, is there? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, according to you, what will trigger the mass adoption of Metaverse and Web3 all across the world? Right. Well, I think when the when more countries implement their central bank digital currencies, which are on the horizon, so I think the governments all resisted it initially, but now they're thinking, this lets us control people's money. Let's do it. And I think you'll find that you're having to you know, you won't be doing a tax return at the end of the year to pay your tax. The government will just take it out of your digital wallet. Um, and I think that will force more people um, to use Web3 and the metaverse. Do you see GDPR as a threat to metaverse? Because presumably, if you have a metaverse, you could have someone from Europe and someone from outside Europe having a conversation. And the metaverse could be in different places. So where is the data stored, right? Because potentially both those people having a conversation have a claim to that conversation. The European citizen has a claim to that conversation as well as the non-European Union citizen also has the claim to that conversation. So does GDPR apply to that? Does it not? Do you see that as a threat? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, because different countries have, and not just for GDPR, but for all different sort of laws and things that are acceptable online. I think it's very interesting um, for people outside Europe that will be communicating with people inside Europe. It, it sort of brings the bigger question about who owns our data. In Web3, we're supposed to own our own data, but anytime you fill in your, your personal details on some metaverse site, website, whatever, where is that data being stored? How long is it being stored for? And what is being done with it? Are you being advertised to because of some data that you entered? Mm. <laughs> that, that, do you see that as, as uh, a threat from the terms that if the regulators push it too much, they could create a bipolar world where there is one metaverse for European Union citizens, and then there is one metaverse for everyone else. Because you don't want to violate European Union rules and risk getting sanctioned, um, but you also want to serve the other community. So do you think if the European Union takes a harder stance on this, then the creators, the developers could just section just cordon them off into a uh, into a metaverse that is only for themselves. Yeah, I think that's really dangerous. I mean, when Tony Parisi coined the seven rules of the metaverse, rule number one was there is only one metaverse. So for people having separate, I mean, I know there are separate metaverse platforms, Sandbox, Decentraland, all the other ones, these are platforms, but they all are part of the greater one metaverse. The metaverse is supposed to be open to all. And I think creating sort of silos or ghettos, it's just web two all over again. It, it defeats the purpose of the metaverse where you should be free to exchange conversations and data with anyone anywhere in the world. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so let me ask you the next question, and I think you'll have a unique perspective on this since you are a consultant that works in the speed. What would bring e-commerce to Metaverse in Web3? Right. So don't tell people that they are on the blockchain just to tell them, you know, go into this website. This is fun. This is an experience. This is like a game. Um, let them pay for experiences within these metaverses using their credit or debit card. Let them use fiat money. 
Um, don't make everybody learn, like, oh, how do I get by Ethereum? How do I get a wallet? What does this mean? All the terminology. I think we need to take it back to basics. People buy things on Amazon, right? Now, I buy things on Amazon. I've no idea how my money goes from my account to the Amazon account, to the seller's account. I don't need to know. I'm getting nice goods and services. And that's how the metaverse has to pitch itself. It's like you can do fun stuff, you can buy goods, um, and it's not rocket science. You don't have to have a Web3 degree to, to do it. So come and join us, it's fun. <laughs> if you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Do you think, do you think the whole crypto and Web3 industry has made a big mistake by not using credit cards, debit cards, PayPal and such services as no one's saying that don't use crypto, but also allow the people that are not comfortable using crypto, allow them access by using credit cards or debit cards. Do you think that is a big mistake that the industry does? Yeah, I, mean, I think things are getting better. And I, th I think uh, a lot of the banks and financial institutions are maybe a bit scared about, you know, crypto and decentralization taking away the need for their existence. So certain banks will not let you spend money on certain Web3 platforms, you know, trying to get money out of one of my bank accounts into, say, Binance to buy some cryptocurrency. It just gets blocked. But now the exchanges are offering more ways to pay, so you can pay on PayPal and all sorts of other on-ramps to, to buy crypto. And then the other challenge is once you've got all this crypto, how do you change it back into fiat to pay your electricity bill? So there's lots of issues there. And some of the NFT platforms that were selling the art, like um, there's one owned by the Winkle Bros brothers, um, they, they, they own Gemini, and they set up this platform called Nifty Gateway, and you could buy NFT art with your credit card. And that was really good for onboarding people. And it was also more stable. So if you'd paid sort of one ETH for a piece of art, that's maybe say $2,000. And then the price of ETH drops significantly. Then it's like, oh, I've lost money on that piece of art already. But if you bought it in pounds or dollars, then the price of it is stable. Absolutely. Um, do you see election campaigning happening in the metaverse? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a really cool idea. I've seen all sorts of things in the metaverse. I've seen demonstrations. I've seen um, celebrations of life at people's funerals. I've seen all sorts. So yeah, I think campaigning would be good. I think um, advertising in the metaverse, you know, in, in real life, you get these billboards saying, vote for us, we're better than the other guys. You could easily do things like that in the metaverse and have like these sort of question debates between the, the two parties with an audience. There's lots of nice arenas. Um, in the spatial metaverse, where I have a couple of galleries, um, there's a lovely arena called the CR NFT arena. And I attend a lot of events and there's people all sitting, because it's spatial, your avatar can sit down, it's really cool. Um, and you're sort of listening as if you're in some amphitheater. And it's, it's a really good way to keep up to date with uh, politics. Absolutely. For your experience, and I presume your experience will shape your opinion, um, who do you think will win the future of Metaverse? Is, is it VR or is it AR? Oh, I think it has to be AR. Um, I think there has to be like a layer on top of real life. I can't wear a VR headset. A lot of people get motion sickness. I feel I'm going to fall over. 
Um, and there's also limitations with the hardware. It's very heavy to wear a VR headset. You can only wear it for like 45 minutes at a time and you get neck problems. So I think if you've got your phone and you, you, so you're walking along the street and then suddenly you're wearing this digital outfit on your phone, that's really good fun and practical. If you're going to buy some real clothes to wear, you want to see what it looks like on you, you superimpose it. Um, in AR. I think that's definitely the way to go. Okay. Um, let me ask you this question then. When it comes to immersiveness of Metaverse and Web3, would that then be VR headsets or holographic projections? Oh, wow. Oh, holographic projections would be amazing. I mean, and why not? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, since you do work with art, and, and I presume you work with fashion industry a little bit as well, um, yeah. how far from your experience do you see haptic suits from being reality? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's going to happen. Yeah, definitely. Um, Everything takes time to develop. I mean, a lot of the digital fashion people that I work with, um, yeah, you, you, can, you can buy the item of clothing and hang it in your wardrobe in the metaverse, but they haven't quite got the technology in some cases for your avatar to wear it and move around. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I mean, people in gaming, they, they wear skins on their avatar and, and that works very well. So. Yeah, I think this is definitely a, a growth area for the future. Absolutely. Um, can Metaverse and Web3 aid in bridging social justice in society? Yes, I think um, because of the anonymity of avatars and if you're not using your real voice, if you're typing your conversation, I think that's a real leveler and it takes out a lot of bias. So if people in real life, I heard my voice, that, oh, that's a woman, no, I'm not going to listen to her opinion. But if I'm just an avatar who's typing words, then they'll take my word, it's my words they'll pay attention to, not what I look like or my age or my accent. So I think that um, will provide, provide more justice. Absolutely. Um, what's the role of Metaverse in Web3 in law enforcement? Oh. Um, so I think, yeah, there's lots of things that can be done um, to make people behave properly in the metaverse. So if, say, someone in the metaverse is bullying another person, then you could, um, you know, delete their avatar from that metaverse. You could fine their wallet money. You could give them a timeout. You could, you know, put them in metaverse jail. There's lots of um, things you could do. I mean, arguably, this is getting into the ethics side of it, but you, you could, yeah, there's lots of things you could do. You could um, put that avatar in sort of a metaverse jail. You could um, find their wallet. You could even go as far as deleting that person from your metaverse platform on a permanent basis and knowing that if that wallet ever tries to create another avatar they will be barred so all these types of measures can um, ensure that people act appropriately so that's like the, the policing absolutely um let me ask you this question then charmaine if there is crime committed within the metaverse right and you especially talked about the boundary around your avatar if there is a crime committed within the metaverse or web3 who should be responsible for it right well it, it has to be the, the person committing the crime really i mean if we're allowing freedom of speech and open metaverses where people can see what they want we have to trust people to do the right thing and not commit crime. It's quite similar to the real world. And although it's difficult without KYC, you know, how can you trace this person in real life to put them in jail? Um, so there maybe needs to be KYC 
for certain elements of the metaverse if you want to be able to do certain things. Absolutely. Um, in real life, especially within England and Scotland, um, coming out of that global um, disease of 2020, within 2022, we see a lot of charities, especially food banks, and we saw that in Blackpool recently where um, a lot of uh, charities are not getting the funding that they need, right? There's more people coming through the door than they have the capability to provide for. And the donations are down coming out of the global disease of 2020, right? Um, so with that knowledge, do you think charities are using the NFT technology enough to fundraise for their charitable needs? Because they essentially all these NFTs that are being created, charities could work with artists and, and fundraise that way, right? But do you think that they are using that technology enough? I, I don't think they're using it enough. I've seen lots of NFT collections and projects which say, if you buy my NFT, I will give 20% of the profit to the Malala Fund or something like that. So there's lots of artists and creators that they're really using it as a marketing tactic to sell their art, saying, I'll give some of it to charity. Um, but yeah, I think the actual charities themselves could be utilizing this better. Absolutely. Should Metaverse and Web3 ownership be anonymous? I'd like to say yes, but then you, you get into all the criminal things as well, don't you? So we've seen lots of rug pulls, you know, the FTX. I've, I've been burnt by um, the, the collapse of the Terra Luna blockchain, all these things. So to protect people, I think really, if you want to do any sort of financial transactions, there should be KYC, it shouldn't be anonymous. You will still get fraudsters, but it just makes it a bit more difficult for them than the anonymity aspect. Absolutely. Um, let me ask you this question. How do you navigate a bipolar or a multipolar world, right? Where you see there is an East-led camp and then there is a West-led camp. And as we go more within technology, there is more and more uh, fight for dominance between China and US, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and as a consultant, especially that someone who's working with it, Metaverse and Web3, how do you navigate this? Because potentially a lot of growth is also in Asia um, and a lot of growth is also in Europe. So how do you balance that uh, from, Etiverse, from Etiverse's perspective? Yeah, so that's an interesting question as well. I mean, a lot of my clients are interested in environmental issues and, you know, obviously Bitcoin mining, proof of work, it's quite intensive on the environment and things like that. So anybody who, any countries that are using sort of green technology, like I know, I think Texas has you know miles and miles of fields of solar panels to generate electricity for bitcoin mining so so that sort of initiative would make people go more towards the us technology and other countries it depends how transparent they are about what they're doing i mean you know china is often not the most transparent in working with other countries so we're not really sure what they're up to with their operations but yeah it is there's pros and cons of different uh, countries that are leading it and, and I think it's good that no one country is leading it um, because then they would be pushing it down their agenda. Absolutely. Um, are venture capitalists investing enough in Metaverse and Web3? I, I think they they need to see what their return on investment is going to be. I've seen a lot of new Metaverse platforms come and go um, because they couldn't get the funding. So 
it was very unfortunate because they've got really good ideas, very inclusive, beautiful graphics, but they don't have the money for the massive GPU servers needed to run those metaverses if you have thousands of visitors in it at the one time. So I think venture capitalists, what, what platform owners need to do is explain better what the potential is because it's huge and if a little bit of investment now from venture capitalists could be the next roblox or the next massive metaverse so yeah it's definitely an area venture capitalists should be focusing on absolutely well that concludes the episode 15 of reading between the lines with tandaban this is sharin short from etiverse the founder of etiverse She's also been involved with Women of Crypto Art, which is a DAO, and she's a member of the Metaverse Standards Forum. It was a pleasure having you, Charmaine, with us. And oh, we hope thank you for having me. Absolutely. We hope to have you again. Before I end this interview, I'd just like to leave you with a single thought that I leave you with after each interview. You be the arbiter of truth, the viewers of the Metaverse Street Journal. Thank you, Charmaine. It was a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Bye. If you like the video, please hit the like button. If you think what's being discussed is nice and you'd like to join the discussion, please comment below. And if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you.